Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first intermission spotlight conversation series. Uh, I'm here with Nico Muley, composer extraordinaire. My name is Nicole Wendell. I'm the director of education for Boston University Tanglewood Institute. Glad to have you with us today. And hi, Nico. Hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. How's it going? You're in New York, right? I am in New York right now. It's going fine, considering that, you know, everything's everything's on fire and no one can leave the house and the world is crazy. It's going fine. <laughs> it's going fine. Yeah, also here. I uh, I did the math and we're at a hundred I'm at a hundred days exactly of quarantine, if you can believe it. Congratulations. I did you make a special did you make a special cake? <laughs> I haven't made a special cake, but I feel like that's in my future, most certainly. Yeah, I mean, special. It's yeah. I'm gonna. I get to a hundred on on Monday, so Ooh. I'm. I have to figure out how I'm gonna celebrate. You're close but behind. It's gonna happen. Yeah, you were telling me early, a little earlier that you uh, were supposed to be in Japan next month. So I was indeed, and I was meant to be in. Uh, I was meant to be in London today. I mean, it's just yeah. It's the. My sense of time has completely evaporated into the ether. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, it's it's deteriorating along along with with so many things. It seems like. Um, so yeah, so give us give us a little bit of the rundown. You've been commissioned by the Met. You've worked with film and Broadway and pop music. I mean, you you do it all. How how <laughs> what how? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I wish I, I wish I had a, a, a better answer for this, but basically I just say yes to everything. <laughs> so if someone calls and says, do you want to make a two second piece of music for this animation I did? You say yes. If someone calls and say, you know, my my weird rock band uh, needs strings for this song, will you will you write them? Yes. Uh, and I think if you get into the habit of saying yes to everything, the nature of everything starts turning into bigger and bigger things. Yeah. Um, and you find yourself in this state of kind of constant collaborative ventures, which is what um, essentially what my, my life is all the time. That's amazing. Yeah, I love that concept of just sort of saying yes and keeping keeping your eyes and your mind and, and your date book open to, to anybody who comes along and wants to, to work on a project. I just, I love that. Is your, is your process the same, do you think, when, when working these different mediums? So that's a that's a interesting and a big question. Um, but I think that what this what it all comes down to for me is is um, two things. It's the speed at which a project has to happen, and it's also who's driving the car, right? And so, for instance, if you're making move, uh, music for a movie, you're not driving the car, right? <laughs> right? The director and the producer they are driving the car, and you happen to be in the car, and you're the last person in, and your work has to happen in about let's say you have to write an hour of music in five weeks, right? And that's a crazy amount. Yeah, that's Whereas huge. if you're writing an opera, you're, you're writing two hours of music in four years. Um, so it's a very different time scale. But what, what I always call upon is a set of skills. And then the question is, are you doing a marathon or are you doing sprints or are you running uphill or are you running downhill? It's, it's the same muscles, but it's like the more you've trained the more ready you are for any of those different things. Um, so the process is entirely different. Um, but mainly, actually, the big distinction in terms of process is, am I in charge or am I not? Because mm. if I'm in charge, then the, there's a fabulousness of, it's my party, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> yes. And usually, But usually those projects are also the most terrifying, right? So it's an orchestra calls you up and says, we would like you to write us a piece that lasts 25 minutes, go. And the next time you will talk to anyone is when you hand them the score, right? Wow. So it's literally, yeah. here's, here's a pile of money, give us a pile of paper. Literally, that's that's the interaction. That's amazing. So, you know, that, and, it, but there's something scary about that too, because you've been handed this, it's like a, it's like being challenged to a duel, right? It's like, I dare you to make something out of nothing. Yeah. Right? There's no structure, there's no this, there's no that, there's no, you know, nothing. Whereas with something like a film or with something like arranging a, pop song or whatever, there already is a structure. There already is an itinerary and you just have to get in there and make it okay. Sure, that makes sense. Do you work in a way that, you know, you're always sort of working, you know, like it's always kind of happening or do you have really structured like, okay, from 9 a.m. to 11.30, 7, mm. I'm gonna do this thing. Um, so, well, it's it's actually really, this, this quarantine has been really interesting. Yeah. Um, for that 
for, about that question because in you know in general I'm traveling so much and doing a million different things and the day is divided up into not I don't want to say social obligations but for instance you know at eight o'clock you're meant to be at the opera or at the concert or at the dinner or whatever it is whereas so what that what that does is it forces you to to make a serious like daily schedule in general I found that. I have a couple good hours of making stuff in me, like really like that scary thing for composers, which is taking some, you know, taking like, taking, you know, this and turning it into this, like yeah. zero to something. <laughs> yeah. And that's the, that's the thing that's still, you know, inexplicable. Like it's really hard to describe what that moment is. So I can do that for a couple, for a little bit. And then there's, then there's the rest of it, right? Where it's like, Oh, can the violins get their mutes off in time? Or mm. oh, can is this double stop feasible at that tempo? Or you know, or is the clarinet you know wh whatever little detail there might be? So I can I I can like squeeze about four hours of the magic thing, and then the rest has to be kind of what I call kind of busy work. It's just sure. it's like chopping the vegetables, just dealing. Yeah, yeah. So today, for instance, to, to give you an example, I I I um had about an hour of actual writing and then I had three hours of literally you know going through stickings for a vibraphone part or you know just like the most tiny details which of course are really important but it wasn't it wasn't me actually like creating yeah that makes sense actually the way you had those note cards there makes me think you were working right up until the time we, we locked on and said hello <laughs> no I was actually you know I, I I always have these note cards around and I I write all manner of random things. I literally like have them next to me at all times. It's just random notes. Like as you ask questions, sometimes I'll jot something down, um, and it helps me focus. So <laughs> it's like a nervous tick. That makes sense. I wonder if that's something that was always in, sort of inherent with you, like this level of knowing what you need in order to keep your thoughts organized and with you, or if you learn that, for example in your crazy time while you were both at Columbia and at Juilliard, which I'm sure was no easy task to manage in itself. Nope. <laughs> I mean, well, so, so you're asking, what's the question? Yeah. <laughs> you're asking about like organization. What is the question? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm wondering whether that organization is inherent within you or whether or not you, that's something you learned how to, to do for yourself. Interesting. I, I made it inherent. Yeah. Um, I made it, uh, I kind of forced that on my life in, but I did it early enough that I did it probably in high school. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just imposed the structure on myself. Um, I had the, I had the luxury of growing up with like artistic parents, not musicians, but they, you know, they lived a life that was very much not, uh, you know, let me put it this way. I was very jealous sometimes of my friends where it was like, we eat every day as a family at 7.30 and then, you know, homework happens after that and then we do this and then like every summer we go here. That was not my family. Like it was this constant kind of people in and out and, and you know, eating at crazy times and doing this and doing that. And we, it, it, there was a, a wonderful kind of bohemian-ness to it. But then come high school, it's like you have to get your act together. Uh, so I, I sort of put a grid on it, um, which when I was at as you as you um, hinted at when I was doing a conservatory and university at the same time, that ability to write out and manage the day on the level of just like, when do I have to leave for the subway? And also what am I writing? And also what am I reading becomes very important. Yeah. But it, I mean, as you, you, you know, this too, it's like as, as someone who there must be a sort of administrative part of your brain and an artistic part of your brain, right? You've got, you know, you've got the spines of your book and the in books behind you in the right order, but you also have a fiddle right above. Oh, yeah, right? that's <laughs> that's definitely true, right? Yeah, there's so there's there's, there's definitely a like, <laughs> like I'm gonna do chapter by chapter, and then I'm gonna play Isai. Yeah, I wish I wish though I could transfer. This is something that I've always wanted for myself that I could never impose effectively is I could transfer that organization, say, from, from the bookshelf or from that administrative, like, here's a really well done email that has all the information you'll ever need uh, to my practice. Right. Such as the one I received from you like 55 minutes ago, yeah. Isn't that a special one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I wish I could transfer I was like, okay. <laughs> to my to my practice. Like, in the morning, like, I'm going to do this, and this is what I'm working on, and this is how I'm going to do it. But whenever I pick up the violin, there's, there's so much more to it than just that kind of direct approach. That, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a balanced 
you know what you know what i now now, that, now i'm reversing the uh the thing i i do this all the time i take a piece of paper and i write the hours of the day mm-hmm. next on it in that order and then when you can see your day like this you can really start writing things in and say you know scales up here yeah you know you you can really you can really plan it out in a super zoomed out way you know, so for instance, this is this could be you tomorrow, right? So it's like, oh, can you like, take a picture and send that to me? <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's literally what I do. I mean, today it was like, you know, things I knew were happening. There's one thing I knew was happening today, which is this. Yeah. I knew that was happening at 5:30, and that we were going to meet beforehand to make sure the technology worked. So that was 5:10, <laughs> right? That was the object. And from there, I built the rest of the day out, right? So it's like, I'll get up at six, I'll do this, I'll ride my bike to the studio, I'll work on this for three hours. So it really, it, it's incredibly useful, even if you don't actually do it that way, just to sort of have a piece to of paper that says, yeah, yeah, I'm draft sure that's, one. I'm sure that's really helpful also in this super special quarantine time where, you yes. know, so much of your time in a way is yours, right? As opposed to, like you say, like traveling and, and having a really rigid schedule, like you have to be at the opera hall at eight mm-hmm. and, and this kind of thing, but can then make it a little hard to organize. Do you, have you been able to capitalize on that? Was there a transition? This or? is, you know, this is a hard, a hard question. And this is, you know, for, for all of you, for all of you watching out there, um, whoever, whoever you may be, you know, I think it's okay that we all have this conversation as artists, uh, that it's okay to not be okay in this moment. Like there is so much that's wrong with what's happening right now on, not just on the level of, you know, everything's canceled, not just on the level of like palpable racial inequality in a way that we haven't experience you know that my gener- my generation down to people sort of in their teens like has not have not experienced that we've only read about and you know it, it's like we're living through this this very i would say double intense moment right now and we've come to realize that the thing that we all do right making music in public at one another is gone for the foreseeable future right um and so i think I think that it's all right. To, this is a this is a safe environment for us to say it's okay for this not to be cool, right? And I've resisted. You know, I wish I had. I wish I had an answer to what the right strategy is. Like, I wish I knew the the surefire way to make it okay. Um, and I haven't figured it out yet. You know, and it's been three months, and I still don't really know. I, and it's definitely not the case that. You know, in the first couple of weeks, I had a lot of people, especially, I say especially exclusively mm-hmm. non-musicians, being like, don't you find that this time is just a gift? Like, haven't you always wished for, like, unstructured time, like, in your house, like, with your man and your dog? And I think, <laughs> if this is a gift, like, I should have kept the receipt. Like, this is a nightmare. <laughs> Like, yeah. I won't take it back to Best Buy today <laughs> like, like, if they were open, you know. Yeah. Like, I mean, you like, I will be at the Chestnut Hill Mall in 45 minutes to return this gift. <laughs> like, it's, yeah. it's the worst. It's, it so, is you trying, know, for sure. It's trying, and it's, it's, it's bizarre, and it's hard to, you know, it, re- it really teaches you something about yourself and your priorities in what can actually feel like a kind of ugly way. Um, and I think, you know, for me, uh, the, I, let's say the sort of superficial priorities of living a life that takes place in different continents, right. And living a life where I get to see old friends in fabulous situations, right. Like it's like, oh, I wrote you a concerto. Great. See you in Singapore. You know, that's, I mean, that's like a thing that, you know, that, that, that happens and one takes that for granted, but then also just on the level of how you divide up your day right. and how you think of how you think about, you know, I, I've been doing something um, to, well, since this started, well, since maybe a month after this started, which is protest bedtime. So because I can't go to the concert, I just get into bed at eight 30. <laughs> like, cause otherwise I'll be sad that I'm not at the concert. Right. You know what I mean? Like, no, cause it's, and, and I, I, I think, you know, in the summer, I don't know what you, what you, think you're going to be doing at 8 30 but if i'm not on the lawn at tanglewood watching petrushka right. then i'd rather just bed yeah, like then. i'm not gonna invent some yeah. to do yeah that makes <laughs> a lot of sense so it's pro- protest bed which I sounds like, like a terrible piece of contemporary music but yeah 
I think David Lang has like three productions of it. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> if not, then he will. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I experienced you know, the same listening. the same thing. Uh, I think that maybe a lot of people did is that you know this whole thing hit, everything changed, right? And like came screeching to a halt and went into triage mode, right? Like, okay, these are all the things that need to happen in order to make this okay. And then I took about a month and a half to like mourn my life a little bit, mm -hmm. yeah, right? And I, you know, was scrolling through the, the social medias and noticing, as you mentioned, everybody's saying, aren't we so lucky to have this time to practice? And yeah, I was like, I, I actually can't even touch my fiddle, right? I can't, yeah. I can't just sit down and play some long tones. It feels wrong, it feels bad. And then slowly yeah, starting it feels to come against out of it. nature. <laughs> yeah, it feels against nature. Yeah, and and it's and, you know and it's even it's even weirder as a composer because it's not we don't even have a physical thing, right? It's like we, yes, yeah. you can write like this, but it's not. You know, it, but what this has exposed is that it is a it is a it is actually a thing that you have to practice. Like being a composer is something that you have to actually compose at some point, and having the having my normal way of doing it uprooted is very very odd yeah and i hadn't realized how much i was addicted to the the i was addicted to having my work disrupted because it made me fight in a oh. in a weird way like for instance when when just to give a really tangible example when i'm uh at tanglewood which i usually am for like 10 days a summer um, i bring my whole computer with me and i bring all this you know i bring my work and I get up early and I work for a couple of hours and then I teach, 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 master class, whatever, whatever. And then there's usually a kind of period around five or six and I work for another hour and then I do concert stuff, right? Yeah. So that's like, let's say three hours of work a day. Being forced to know that I have three hours is incredibly productive. Right. Whereas now it's like, it doesn't matter. Like I could, I could write for three hours, I could write for 12 hours, I could not write, it's, there's no, there's, there's no walls on the building anymore. So it's really, it's, it's a really bizarre time to be, um, to be asked to make work. I will also say that, you know, part of this is, is, I, an addiction is a good, is a good word. Um, and I think it's useful, you know, understanding that we're talking to younger people here, that it doesn't have to be this way, right? Like, it, right. like I, w I wish I had granted myself the pleasure or the whatever of learning how to deal with unstructured time when I was a lot younger. I just, I never did. Like, I always had a job all through college. Mm -hmm. I always had summer jobs. I very, I never went to summer festivals as an adult. Um, so I never had, I never went to an artist residency until like last year when you have that kind of unstructured time. So it's, it's a skill I don't have, and I'm 38 years old. I don't know how to deal with a date with no with no appointments. Yeah, yeah. In a way, it's kind of uh, to all of those who are a bit younger than than I am. It's kind of nice to have to learn that skill because I I'm the same way. Like, if I if I don't have the pressure of okay, I have to fit this in and fit this in and fit this in, and I have 30 minutes, like you say, to get the work done, then it's a little bit easy to say, okay, uh, I can't wait to work today. I'm gonna drink my coffee and probably do that at some point. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, exactly. And exactly. also I think it, it, bears, it bears saying that how we started this, which is that it's okay. It's okay to not know how to deal with that large amount of time. Yeah. It's okay to feel really overwhelmed and almost grieved, like I said, grieved the loss of what feels like normalcy. Yeah, I remember, I mean, it's, and it's, I think also, you know, again, this is, this is a, a, a danger of being older and, and, you know, nominally successful, whatever that means. It's, it's like you flew closer to the sun, so you have farther, farther to fall, mm -hmm. right? Like more, th more things were canceled, the ramifications of which are bigger just in you know financially and logistically and emotionally and you know it's like it's like and that that itself becomes its own form of guilt right thinking like you know I had 20 things canceled or something but realizing too that that's that that is as emotionally crazy as having one thing canceled right if you had one thing this summer that was the big thing that you've been working on for your whole life that's canceled you know that it it's equally 
shut down. Yeah. So there's something there's something very um, there's something very uh, democratic about the way that we're all. Yeah, <laughs> we're I'm sure all a suffering. lot of the BUTI students are having that same sense of loss. Like, I worked so hard to get here, and looking forward yeah. to that amazing time on the lawn <laughs> and then having it it's really that that was what I mean I don't I don't know if I'm tormenting anyone but that was what sent me like when like I I gotten a call from a friend in the in the BSO like the day before they announced that it was officially not happening mm -hmm. like and I I like the like the UTI was like okay like it's a university like whatever they can't it's like a whole other structure like you guys canceled way before that's like yeah but the BSO they'll figure it out and then I was like oh come on <laughs> Yeah, it's every, you know every every summer since I was thirteen or fourteen, so I've been going, and it's yeah. Anyway, so I mean, I don't want to I don't want to dwell on what we're what we're missing out on. We should I probably we should probably turn to something slightly more optimistic. <laughs> than, like, yeah, maybe maybe less. But that having been said, one thing I will say is now that we're really tasting what it feels like to miss something, mm -hmm. I have been more and more optimistic. Like I, it was easy to be pessimistic and be like, we're never going to work again. There will never be music. Like no one will ever be, you know, orchestras. Are dead. But actually I think after the summer season, when people really have that bitter taste of, of, of being able to articulate what they lost, mm -hmm. which is, you know, seeing people in a room playing the viola near them. <laughs> like I think people are going to go double, double down on yeah. how important it is that, that actually happens. I think that's true. Actually in, in, with that in mind, What's the first thing, I guess there will, this will never end. There will never be like a, a great reveal of like, we're done, hooray. But what's your first, like, what are you craving? What do you, what's your first thing you want to do? That, you know, no one has actually asked me that. And that's a very good question. I mean, it depends on, it depends on when it is. Right. Right. So if it's, you know, if it's like, if it's November, I want to go to Cambridge in the UK and I want to go to a little college choir like a little a little college chapel and I want to hear their choir sing something really specific at like 4 30 p.m on a Tuesday <laughs> I want to know that the music of like that like sacred music is now back I want to know that that stream has been turned back on yeah. you know the, the, the damn block. I want that and I want to go see a big stupid 19th century opera with like horses on the stage and you know the most ridiculous like jersey shore plot of like straight italian people <laughs> fighting about nothing. i want it <laughs> that's that's like literally what i want yes yeah. <laughs> so i guess those two things and then after that i want to go for like 40 minutes to a totally wacky new music thing where it's like somebody partially naked covered in blood on the floor with like a single light bulb oh mm -hmm. um in berlin maybe maybe berlin and then after that then we'll see then then, then we'll then see what comes then, next <laughs> yeah then then like beethoven then razamowski whatever the thing is <laughs> but yeah whatever that stuff is but the, the, the important stuff first yeah 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 so I actually, I'm I'm so curious and i want to ask you and i think probably any of the students of bti who would have been involved uh would ask you this you know, when you, I, I alluded to it a little bit earlier, when you were at Columbia and Juilliard at the same time, you were doing work in English, you were doing work in composition. What, why? Were you thinking like, <laughs> I mean, obviously why, but were you thinking like, maybe I'll go this route, maybe I'll go that route? Or were, were they very informative to each other? Like, was it important to be integral in that way to your work? Yeah, so I have, a, I have two ways of answering that. Um, <laughs> There's a, uh, let's start with the nice way. <laughs> For me, all through high school, I didn't go to a, I didn't go to a performing arts high school. I went to a, a very good high school in Providence, Rhode Island that had a very good music uh, like program and, and department, but it was focused more on performing and they, it wasn't, anyway, it wasn't like Walnut Hill or whatever. It was like a, a regular, what you would call like a liberal arts high school. Sure. Um, and so I always, felt like it was important for me to be good at school and I loved English and I loved reading and I loved critical thought and what ended up happening as a result of going to both schools is of course that I ended up meeting people who were at the absolute top of their game but not at the viola right mm -hmm. at literary criticism or at 
you know, 19th century French literature or at physics or whatever. And actually those friendships, and I, I can come back to this idea, but those friendships were ones that helped me be a better um, musical communicator. Uh, the reason being, and now we get to the second, the second way I answer this question is that um, I went to visit a friend of mine at Juilliard uh, when I was a junior or senior and I was super shocked by how not like worldly anyone was because mm -hmm. it was really clear that most people who were there and P.S. this is like before the internet so this wouldn't be necessarily true true like as much as it is right. as much as it was then but it was like I don't think a lot of people there had left the house since they were like 12 years old because they were like chained yeah. in the basement practicing you know practicing Vinyasky or something right yeah and there was this, I, I got this really weird kind of sense of like a, a incredible amounts of talent, but a, a, a disconnect a little bit from the stuff that I cared about, um, which was to say, you know, words and grammar and language and ideas and images and whatever. Like, you know, which, which again, I think if you want to go to conservatory, you should go to conservatory. And I think it's a lot easier now to be interested in things that aren't what you do because of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, but that freaked, me, that freaked me out. And I, I had wanted to go to Juilliard, you know, like any, you know, like any 15 year old, you're like, I'm gonna go yeah. to Juilliard and move yeah, to New York. Right. And then I, then I got back from that trip and thought, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so then I, then I compromised on myself and I, <laughs> I was like, I still want to go, sure. but in a slightly different way. Um, anyway, but, but I think, you know, if there's one, if there's one, super practical piece of advice I always give composers, but I think this applies to musicians as well. It's like, it's like, find your family, find your adult family. And a lot of those people are going to be musicians and you're going to, you're going to know those people forever. And you're you're going to write them music forever, but it's probably good if a lot of them aren't. And it's probably good if you find people who have done the same thing that you have, right? Which is that you've sacrificed so much of your childhood to, to the sort of, you know, furnace of your talent. Right. Right. And this is true. If you're a cello player or if you're a composer, it's like you, you spent so much time learning to do this one thing really well, find the people who have done that, but about something else. Sure. So find the people who've done that about chemistry or about history or about like, find those, find those colleagues. And those are the people that you should actually be aiming your art at. Right. It's like the smartest people, but of a different thing. Yeah. Um, and, and it teaches you to communicate it. Right. Because it's so easy as a composer to write music that only other composers like get. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Right? And it's like, I, I heard you say or I read somewhere that you had written something about your time at 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 Juilliard and Columbia, where you would give concerts and your friends from both schools would come and at the end of the performance, the the people who who you really were fascinated by, the, were the were the non musicians, right? Because they were there just really in the moment, right? They're not thinking about form, they're not thinking about style, they're not thinking about you know all the technique that it takes to to do the amazing thing that, that you do. Um, they're just like, wow, that's a thing that just happened it's, to me. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. And it's like in, in the same in the same way, it's like you want you want those people there because they 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 get it in a totally different way, right? They and their access point to it is not our access point to it, but and they're you know, for instance, they're not gonna know, oh, like that E flat was a little a little sharp, <laughs> yeah. you know, or whatever. But what they what they will know if they go to your recital is that you sold it, right? And they, or they will know that you felt confident in your body on that stage. And it's like, you know, I think one of the most moving moments I had was a bunch of my friends from Columbia, not one of them is a musician, came to a composer's concert at Columbia, at, at Juilliard to hear my piece. But weirdly, one of them came up afterwards and said, uh, this is actually about another BUTI alum, Nora Kroll Rosenbaum, who I think was 2016, uh, or, or sorry, 2016, 2000, <laughs> wait, what am I saying? 1999, it doesn't matter, whatever. One she was my years. second year there. <laughs> 1997, 97. Yeah. 97. So Nora, you know, was a colleague of mine at Juilliard and a friend of mine 
I'd heard a bunch of her music. And after this one concert, he came up to me and was like, you know, your piece was great, but I thought that Nora's piece was so interesting because I've heard all these four or five days. And I was like, okay, you keep me track of Nora now? <laughs> like, it was great. That's amazing. To, but to realize that, like, that, that these concerts had become something trackable in a system that wasn't Juilliard composition seven arts. Right. Um, and it was, it was really moving. And I think, again, it's like, that's something that we all have to hold on to. And it's not that you don't, make music for your peers because of course you do but it's like you you have to invite other other ears into your into your um ecosystem yeah and i bet it also helps to build voice right or or artistic personhood if you will like instead of just you know caring about oh all the pagging all the pagadini notes were literally perfect and and yeah. yet you didn't necessarily like we call it like break the third wall right and and reach somebody and the fourth the, the fourth four, wall sorry. the third the third wall the third, the third wall, wall is the, the, the wings yeah. <laughs> yeah you, you want that you want that we'd like that we'd like the sound to to carry <laughs> but yeah that that you really reach someone and touch somebody and it's maybe it's not super perfect and and how do you build that voice right I mean you do it and, and also which is to say like. It, it can also be perfect and touch somebody, oh, right? I've never, I've never quite bought. It's that's a fault. I mean, I don't know if any of y'all have gone to one of those Hillary Hahn concerts where she plays it not just perfect, but like extra perfect in ways where you're like, I don't know if that's like you found the epitome of what an A sharp is. Like, I don't know where you found it, and I'd like to follow you there in my car, <laughs> but like that was amazing. And and also right. it moves you in a way. It's like it. That's so special when it's when the, the two intersect and I, I think you should you should never think oh well if you're just aiming to move people it doesn't matter what you play you know it's no I, I think you can they're, they're both they're both mountain peaks that you should aim to get to and if you get to them both at the same time which you will probably do like a sixth of the time it will revolutionize other people's lives yeah i think that's true and i i think that you kind of encapsulate and embody this this motion in and out of the classical music world and and being really excellent at all of it i mean there's this you know about it but in case any of your viewers don't there's this sushan stevens album planetarium that you worked on and collaborated with and helped arrange and performed on also is that right no, that's a, that's actually a, that's a that's an equal billing like we it's like me and sufian and bryce like it's all of our it's all of our work like it's it's one two three it's equal, equal collab it's totally equal and it's yeah amazing and it's a little bit outside Thanks. of what the normal like inside the concert hall thing that you would expect but it's so much also a part of your identity and and your voice and you use that agency so well and I don't know I wonder if you could speak a little bit maybe to our our students who might be watching of how to how to speak that voice you know, when when you're being sort of funneled down this the classical canon road of like how to be excellent. Right. So it, it actually relates to what we, what we said before, which is like the muscle is the muscle and how you use it can differ. But for instance, you know, you never want to be in a situation where you can't do anything that comes up. Right. And, and I, I would think about your technique as the most precious and flexible object that you have, even though to you, your technique is like these scale and these bow exercises and these tips and, you know, where, and exactly where you put this and touch this and look over there and taste this. And, you know, it, it's, we, you can, you can think about technique as a list of like a shopping list of these things that you have to do. And they're all really hard. But when you, for instance, when you're thrust into a collaborative environment, right? It, so pretend you're a trumpet player and, you know, your sense of your technique is, oh, okay, I can nail that thing from Petrushka, right? But actually what your technique is, is all the stuff that you did to build up to learn how to do that, right? And so all those muscles that you've built up, all, not just musical, but rhythmic and, and you know, your embouchure and like everything, when you're asked, when you're chucked onto a stage with like a rock band and they're like, oh, okay, no, don't do it like this. Don't do it like, do it like that. And it's not on the page. It's not notated. You, 
some some like reptilian part of your brain will remember that you know how to do that and you know how to translate that from what you were just told into your technique. So, so your technique is the most important thing, I think. And it's it's like uh, another another metaphor I give is is you know if you if you cook well, that doesn't mean you follow a recipe perfectly, but it means that someone could drop you in another country in a house that has like you know two peppercorns some totally confusing orange <laughs> and there's like a supermarket that has you know four different things in it and you don't know what any of them are because you know you don't speak turkish or whatever <laughs> and you can make like an amazing meal yeah. like it's it's like that's that's what it is like your technique is not oh i can make this like super elaborate french like dish that has 67,000 ingredients although that's useful <laughs> it what what it's really about is is being shocked by something and then problem solving. And that's that's really what it comes down to for me as, as a collaborator. So, so so for that album Planetarium, that was me and Sufjan and Bryce, and we've known each other for you know since the since the beginning of time, basically. Um, being able to kind of release our artistic kind of preoccupations to just make something together. Uh, and you can I think you can only do that kind of work if you're really confident that your technique is solid and then you can kind of deploy it for the, for a, a bigger project. That makes a lot of sense. I love, I love that way of looking at technique as, as a tool rather than something that you just, it's abstract and is, is playing, but it's a tool to, to build greater things. That's awesome. And how did it's, it really, it really is like a, an important thing to, if they're, if they're younger, younger musicians or any musicians listening to this, it's like, you will you will be forced to do things, especially now, right? Especially now that the world is about to be really different. You will have to figure out how to take that technique that you've spent years doing and apply it to playing into a microphone, right? And you will have to learn how to translate all that work you've done doing, you know, learning like some, you know, Stamets clarinet concerto or something <laughs> and, and translate that into remote recording a film score over an ISDN line. Like these are things that you're going to have to do. And it requires you to have built up like every muscle in your body to get ready to do that. Yeah. I love it. And actually the way that you just gave me a great segue to start talking about some of our students questions who, who have questions about that. Um, so I'm just going to give you a couple. So this first question is from Marco Jimenez from St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg, Florida. Hey, Marco, what's going on? I know you. He, uh, he's been with us the past three years. He's going to be with us again in the in the Young Artist Piano Program um, for a third year in a row, which is so exciting. But, but though, even though I've been I've been telling him for three years, he's got to do composition, <laughs> but that's fine. Well, I think I... Marco, I celebrate your journey. I think it was a choice this year whether or not there was there was a composition or a piano component, so I'm well, sure... It's, a, it's actually a good thing the whole thing was canceled because now he didn't have to make that choice. <laughs> So. And he gets to ask you this question. Uh, how is COVID-19 changing your approach to music making, if at all? Is it making you see music in a new light or unlocking new facets of it that weren't as apparent before? And I personally will just take this one step further to ask how you think, with that in mind, young musicians should be changing or reframing their perspective on, on what a future career in this field might look like. Mm -hmm. Um, so, well, I think we talked about a lot of this before mm -hmm. about like how it's changed, I mean, how it's changed everything just on a really practical level. Um, and Marco, to answer your question more, more specifically, I think that what it's shown me is how fragile and how social what we do really is. And how, um, which is to say, all of the things that we value as as classical musicians, as people who work with like notated music, as people who work in a primarily acoustic um, environment that requires people to be in the same room with one another, all those things are are very um, expendable suddenly. And it's really hard to, it's really hard to hear that. Like, it's really hard to realize that you can just end it like overnight, just gone. Right. And so what it's, it's made me do 
I'm speaking very personally here, but it's 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 made me reanalyze why it is that I do what I do. Like, what's the what what's the thing that I'm looking looking for, and what's the service that I'm providing to people with this you know random skill that I happen to have? And so you think, well, okay, if we can't do it the way that we've been trained to do it, now what? And so you know, it's about thinking, okay, should we all learn how to record from our houses? Yes. Right. Should we all learn how to write music that we know will be recorded by people in different places? Yes. Should we all treat the tools that we have, the technology that we have right now, such as the internet, you know, as something um, to be harnessed for creative use? Absolutely. I mean, can you imagine if this happened in like the eighties? I mean, it would, like, I mean, in the eighties, just if you're listening, like, you, there, was, your phone was plugged into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, you were not about to, you were not about to play, you know, no. <laughs> like, no, it was not, it was not going to happen. Anyway, so, so, Mark, to, to answer you again, sorry, it's that it, it's changed, it's it's made me, it's rewired my brain in terms of thinking about what what it actually means to be a composer and and what it means to be making music at this time, right? Like who wants it? How are they receiving it? How are they, how are people listening to things? I will say I'm optimistic because I'm, I'm pretty sure that everyone else is as addicted to live performance as I am and will do anything it takes to get it back as soon as possible. And I cannot wait for the next time I'm sitting on Tanglewood Lawn enjoying just that. You don't even know. (laughs) You don't even know. (laughs) Can't even tell you. Um, another question you, you a little bit touched on this right before we talked about Marco's question. This comes from, um, Alexei Zarevsky in, in Valley Cottage, New York. Alexei is a violinist. He was with us last year in, as part of the Young Artist Orchestra and would have been playing string quartets as we speak this year in our string quartet workshop. Oh no, I probably, I probably would have been, you know, awkwardly coaching you with Caroline. (laughs) (laughs) That's probably true. That's probably literally true. (laughs) Oh man, that's too bad. Uh, But he wants to know how, or if you have any advice on how musicians get into the business of recording soundtracks for for movies and TV shows, you know? Ooh, that's a very, that's a very good question. So I think what you do, um, if, so, uh, so I'm not a musician, so as in, I'm not a performer, so I've never actually had to do this. But what you do is you've got to meet someone who contracts those scores. Um, this is why people still move to LA. I don't know why people do this, but they do. Yes, they do. And I think I think it's literally in LA. It's a question of just you have to find someone who contracts film scores. Um, you have, or you have to find a composer who works in film scores. Or you have to, in some way, like inveigle yourself into that, into that tiny, it's not tiny, but into, into that world. What I will say is that, you know, things are becoming a lot more remote now. And big movies don't necessarily have, um, you know, giant orchestras. And you can, you, you have a lot of um, performer, performer composers. Uh, the, the woman who won the Oscar for Best Score for Joker, Hildur Kunnadadur, she, Hildur, who's amazing, is a cellist. Like, her, she, her craft is connected to her instrument. And I would say that her, her practice comes out of a performing musician's, like, universe. Um, so it's, it actually might not be about just meeting a contractor. It might just be about meeting filmmakers, just, just getting yourself in, in that world in some way. Um, and I think things are going to change also in terms of, well, they have been changing. Like it's, it's rare now that people have a huge orchestral soundtrack and when they happen, it's like star Wars or Harry Potter or whatever. And you know what I mean? So, so, uh, there are a lot of side paths into that. Um, and I, I, I'm all, all I'm saying is you don't have to move to LA. It'll probably help, but please tell no one that I said that you should move to LA. Cause I would like, <laughs> Oh God. Anyway, it's fine. You're going to be fine. You're going to be great. Be fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> I'll also add, um, as somebody who has, has been playing in a lot of different kind of settings like that, you should ask if you meet somebody who has done a thing 
that you want to do, ask them how they did that. Ask them if they can invite you the next time they're going to do that. Ask them to put you in touch or refer you to the person who hired them. Never, any of you who are listening, definitely never, ever be afraid to put yourself out there and ask to be included or, or to be on a call list, anything like that. I mean, the absolute worst thing can happen is they say no. A hundred percent. And that'll never happen. And what you do, just don't, and don't be weird about it. Like, don't, don't make it, don't make it awkward. Literally be like, Hey, I've been looking to do some film work. I find, I think it's really interesting. I need to pay my rent, whatever it is, just be honest. And then say, you know, if it ever happens that you need someone, please call me. Right. And just remind them that you exist once in a while. And honestly, it's like, I, I do a lot of like super fast projects sometimes where you need someone quickly and oftentimes that's who you call. Like if, if my like main list of people are all on tour or all playing in the orchestra or whatever, I will a hundred percent call someone who I met in that context. Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's even a matter of just, just location. Like you're hanging out at a coffee shop yeah. with a friend who gets a call and they're like, do you know if I want to choose around? They're like, I do. <laughs> and listen, I like real, real talk. I got asked to do uh, to play like to do some keyboard arrangements on this Adele song randomly and I'm not kidding you the reason it happened is because I knew the producer and he happened to be in the same neighborhood in London and I had like t- t- tweeted some stupid sign I, I saw and then he he like wrote me and was like are you in Soho in London <laughs> like, yes he's like, like could you come to this studio at this time and I was like okay and then it's like two hours later I had like arranged this Adele song so basically yeah <laughs> It's the way and it don't move to LA or move to LA or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So basically make friends and make friends. Be nice. Be nice. Don't be, don't be weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question comes from Austin, Texas. Um, Jason Sato, who is a trombone player. He was going to be with us for the first time this summer in wind ensemble. And we're really sad that he won't be with us, but excited that he brought this question to the table, which I think is the number one question definitely on my mind and and many people who are watching this mind. How did your time at BUTI influence your career? Cool. Um, I can give you such a good uh, example. <laughs> um, so I was, as I said before, I, I was, I went to a high school that wasn't like a performing arts specific high school. We had a good program, but it was, you know, no one, no one was there. It wasn't a performing arts high school. Um, I didn't really know what being a professional musician looked like, right? I didn't, I knew some kind of weirdo musicians and composers and I, you know, I've been studying sort of privately, but it's, you know, it's, it's very abstract when you're 13. Um, and when I went to Tanglewood for the first time, a bunch of stuff happened at the same time, which was that I met colleagues, I met peers, I met people my age who all the ways in which I felt like a weirdo, all the ways in which the music I was listening to wasn't the music my friends were listening to, all the ways in which I had this like very, this gigantic block of information that no one else had. So it wasn't like part of everyone else's homework that you could call someone and be like, oh, like, like problem seven on the Messina. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, I, I, like I had this whole private universe. And then suddenly you're like, oh, it's not just me. It's like all these people are, are equally worried about the Messina, um, which I still haven't figured that out. And in, you know, to a certain extent, it, it was just that, that first moment of meeting colleagues. But then realizing that there is an ecosystem in this world that where where the arts are not cosmetic and the arts are not um this kind of accidental luxury but instead that there's not there's like an entire town and a series of towns and this location and people of all different ages interacting in all these different ways that that's um something that exists and that can be created in microscopic form in your own life, right? Where you as a young person can engage with older people in Austin, Texas, for instance, (laughs) where, but it, it, it opens your eyes immediately to the fact that we're all in it together and that there are these unbelievable moments of synchronicity at Tanglewood where it's like, you'll have had 
the most mind blowing, you know, rehearsal of something where you feel yourself get better, right? In the West Barn or whatever, um, you'll have had a lesson in which, you know, you you figure out something really boring and technical, like really boring. You're like, oh, like this slide position, I can actually get this from this. And then you'll hear a chamber music concert of a composer you never heard of, and it, that will blow your mind. And then you'll have a BSO concert that will, you know, it, it's like all this stuff kind of accumulates um, night after night. And so that that to me was amazing. The other thing that, that's, that was great about BUTI, it was really just finally... Um, understanding as a composer that what you need to do is find your people and write for them literally and this is i this probably doesn't apply to you unless you're a composer also but it applies to you in the reverse which is that if you're a composer you're writing for human beings right you're not writing for you're not writing for you know the oboe you're writing for chains <laughs> and even when it starts being strangers that you're writing for, it's like all the stuff in the textbook treats these instruments like these abstract people, right? Or not even people. It's just like the instrument is the instrument. But when you meet people who do what you do um, and have, who put however, you know, 15 years of experience or, or 10 years or five years, however long you've been playing behind their craft, um, that's a connection that is kind of indelible like that'll be with you your, your whole life so amazingly right now my friend sam solomon who was buti what 95 96 97 maybe he was there right i think then. three years yeah. um uh i met sam because i heard i was living in hawthorne dorm or whatever and i heard the percussionist practicing in the science building i walked down i was like what's that what are you guys doing what's that what's going on you know i've never seen a marimba before i was like from providence you know but you know, there's probably one marimba in like the whole of rhode island um I, and and they were kind to me and showed me how their how their life worked. Um, today, right now, I am proofreading a sextet of percussion music that I'm writing for Sam to teach to Juilliard Summer Percussion Institute wow. students, um, like literally now. And so that's like 24 years ago. We met in the science building at BUTI. And now I'm writing him percussion sex ed. So it's like the, the people you meet are, you'll, you'll never get rid of them ever. <laughs> it's, like, a good thing. it's like a freckle. <laughs> no, 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 it's great. It's great. But seriously, it's like I, the, 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 the intensity of that environment um, makes you, yeah, it changes your life. Yeah. You know, the, of course, this is one of the things that the UTI alums say over and over and over again is that just the people that they meet are with them forever. I mean, even those people who don't necessarily go into music, who don't end up at Juilliard, who don't end up, yeah. you know, on necessarily the world stage, whether or not they go, they decide at Columbia and Juilliard that they're going to follow their their English, you know, career right. and, <laughs> and write or, or, you know, take up journalism. And they run into each other over and over again throughout the course of their lives, which is just, it's just incredible. It's an incredible, incredible thing, that network. Yeah, yeah for sure. So we're we're coming to the end of our time, but I I sort of selfishly, I know that we're in the COVID era. I know that there were a bunch of things canceled, and it's really difficult to answer this question. But I'm going to ask it anyway. But I want to know what big thing is coming next. What's <laughs> what's what's on? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I know it's tif it's difficult well i mean do you mean do you mean a re a rescheduled canceled thing or yeah i mean it could be a rescheduled canceled thing that you're super looking forward to that was going to be a big big deal for you in in the moment or it could be something that you know in the past month while you've seen a total of probably like seven seven people in your circle you have this idea and you can't wait to get together to maybe maybe put it together what Sure. Yeah. I'll tell you, I, I can, I mean, this is going to sound so specific, but like Nadia Sirota, who's an old friend who's taught, who's done sort of coachings with me at BTI. She's a violist, but also she presents on the radio and she's an amazing 360 degree musician. Um, I got a commission to write, I, I've written her viola concerto. I've written her thousands of minutes of solo viola music for my sins. Um, uh, I was going to write her a sec, I, I am going to write her a second viola concerto and it was going to happen in Tokyo in October, but it's going to happen in Tokyo a year from October. Oh, wow. Which is actually great because I was, I was probably going to be a little late turning it in. Um, <laughs> and 
so for me, this is actually a, a perfect like embodiment of what we what we've been talking about. So I've known Nadia since our, you know Juilliard, uh, her first day basically. I mean, we've known each other since since again the beginning of time, twenty years, and knowing that someone else, people who are basically strangers, have paid me to write one of my best friends another viola concerto and then they're going to put both of us on an airplane and we're going to fly to Japan <laughs> and have that happen there fills me with like such enormous pleasure because it takes advantage of not just like all the muscles she built up in her life or me but but our relationship like uh, us as a as a team um and that that we've been asked to kind of occupy 25 minutes of someone's time of this, of this abstract audience in Japan. And so it feels like this kind of magical thing, right? Where it feels like you've been really trusted with something precious, which is other people's energy and time as an audience. And then the, the hands and the skills of all the musicians who will, who will play it with us. So that, that to me is something very, it's super thrilling because it's, it's the perfect combination of music for friends and music for strangers. And then the strangers will become friends and then rinse and repeat. Oh, I love it. I love it. I, I, Wow, what a beautiful ribbon on this conversation. It really brings it all together. Well done. <laughs> um, Yay. <laughs> thank you deeply from the bottom of my heart, from the bottom of my BTI heart. Pleasure. So, so much. Thank you. So, so much. It's, it's really, it's been so much fun. And I look forward to seeing what comes next and, and hearing about next October in Japan. But the, the, main, the main important thing is that I will see you and I will see all of you on the lawn at Tanglewood, and we're going to listen to Stravinsky if it's the last thing I do. <laughs> so I will, I will see you there. See if it's in five years, I, I will be there. I have an outfit all picked out. So. We're ready. <laughs> awesome. See you at that time. Take care. Take care. Good night. Bye. Good night. <laughs>